Hello class, welcome to lesson 1-7, which is all about functions. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to determine whether a relation is a function, and you should be able to find function values. So let's start with some vocabulary. A function is a relationship between input and output. So a function is a relationship between input and output. Okay, and a discrete function is a graph that consists of points that are not connected. So discrete function is a graph that consists of points that are not connected. So it's going to look like a bunch of dots on the graph. A continuous function is a function graphed with a line or smooth curve. So a function graphed. with a line or smooth curve is a continuous function. A vertical line test, or the VLT if you're too, um, if you want to abbreviate it, says if a vertical line intersects the graph more than once, then the graph is not a function. So if a vertical line intersects the graph more than once, then the graph is not a function. Okay, so remember vertical means up and down. A nonlinear function is a function with a graph that is not a straight line. Okay, so a nonlinear function could be something that looks like that. It's all wavy. But a linear function will always be straight lines, okay? Even when my lines don't look the straightest. <laughs> um, function notation is the last thing that we're going to talk about. Equations can be written in this form. You're used to seeing y equals like 3x minus 8. Function notation takes your y and replaces it with f of x. That's how you say that. When you have f and then parentheses x, you say it f of x, the function of x, okay? It means the same thing. You're going to solve it the same way. It's just the difference between it being an equation or being written in function notation. And yes, that is something I will test you on, so make sure you pay attention to directions. Okay, so let's jump into our first example. We want to determine whether each relation is a function. So let's look at our first one. We have a mapping here. And when you have a mapping, remember the left side is your domain and the right side is your range. Okay. In order to determine if each relation is a function, you need to make sure that each domain, so each number in the domain, only gives you one number. Okay. So if we look at this first one, we have a negative 2. It only appears once on the left-hand side, and it gives us a negative 3. We have a 0. That only appears once in our domain, and it gives us a 6, so that's fine. Then we have a 3. It only appears once in the domain and gives us a 6. Is it okay that both 0 and 3 give us a 6? Yes. It's okay for numbers to be repeated in the range. But if numbers are repeated in the domain, then you have issues. Then we have a 4, and that gives us 9. So it looks like our first one is a function because each number in the domain, each number in the domain is paired with only one in the range. Okay, let's look at our next example, 1B. We have a domain and a range in a table format this time. Our domain, let's look at all of our numbers because we're worried about when our domain repeats itself. If all of your domain, if all of them are different numbers, then you're fine. But if you have a repeating number in your domain, that's when you start to run into issues. So our domain, we have a 1, 3, 5, and a 1. So it looks like our ones repeat 
Now this is fine if both ones give us the same number in the range. So let's look, what do we get when we have these ones? We have a four and we have, it's kind of hard to see, but that is a negative four. Is four and negative four the same number? Or are, are four and negative four the same number? No, so we would say <clears throat> that this is not a function because the number one is paired with both four and negative four. Okay. Had both of those been a positive 4, you would have been just fine. But since it gives you both a 4 and a negative 4, it's not a function. So why don't you take a minute and try to look at this one on your own. Hopefully you said this first one, you said yes. For each element of the domain, there is only one corresponding element in the range. Let's take a look at the next one. Try this one on your own. Is this relation a function? No, the element three in the domain is paired with both two and negative one. See, our domain, our x values, there's a three that appears twice, and it gives us a negative one, and it gives us a positive two, so that is not a function. All right, let's look at example two together. We have at an ice sculpting competition, each sculptor's height was measured to make sure it was within the regulated height range of 0 to 6 feet. The measurements were as follows. Team 1 was 4 feet. Team 2 was 4.5 feet. Team 3, 3.2 feet. Team 4 was 5.1 feet. And Team 5 was 4.8 feet. We want to start by making a table of values showing the relation between the ice sculpting team and the height of their sculpture. Okay. So let's start with our x and our y, except instead of using x and y, I'm going to say the team and then the sculpture. The team and the sculpture, okay? So we had team 1, team 2, team 3, team 4, and team 5. Now, how tall was team 1's sculpture? We had 4 feet. Team 2 was 4.5, Team 3 was 3.2, Team 4 was 5.1, and Team 5 was 4.8. So what I did was I took <clears throat> the two known bits of information and I made my table of values. I put the team and I put the sculpture height and I paired them up together. Now, we want to determine the domain and range of the function. So remember, the domain is the input. In this instance, our input is going to be the team because they're making the sculpture, which is the output. Okay, so our domain, remember to do your squiggly brackets, forward S, backward S. We have team 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And then our range is going to be 4, 4.5, 3.2, 5.1, and 4.8. Part C wants us to write the data as a set of ordered pairs. So our ordered pairs, we're going to look at our table. Remember, tables help ordered pairs. It makes it easier to see. You just go vertical. So we have 1, 4, 2, 4.5, 3, 3.2, 4, 5.1, and 5, 4.8. Okay, now we want to <clears throat> think about this for a minute. We want to state whether the function is discrete or continuous and explain your reasoning. So going back to our vocabulary, remember a discrete function is when you have a, um, a function that's made up of a bunch of points that are not connected. And a continuous is when all of those points are connected making a line or a smooth curve. So if we were to graph these points, 
is that going to be discrete or continuous? Is it going to be a bunch of points on a graph or is it going to be a line? This is going to be a bunch of points, so we're going to call it a discrete function because it has many points and not a line. Okay. Your turn to try one. See how you do with this one. Hopefully you chose this bottom table here where the days were one, two, and three and the number of cars sold on the first day was five, second day was three, and the third day was eight. All right, example three. We want to determine whether negative 3x plus y equals 8 represents a function. First, we want to make a table of values. When you are making tables of values, what I want you to do, typically I ask that you try negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2 when you are doing these. Since we only have four slots, I'm just going to start with negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. I'm going to plug those into my function. Okay, so determine whether, or first make a table of values. So now let's plug negative 1 in for x. So then we have a negative 3 times a negative 1 plus y equals 8. So negative 3 times a negative 1 is a positive 3 plus y equals 8. 3 plus what gives us 8? 3 plus 5. So we're done with that one. Now, if we plug in 0, we have a negative 3 times 0, which means that's 0. So we just have a y equals 8. Next, we plug in 1. We have a negative 3 times a positive 1. Negative 3 times positive 1 plus y equals 8. Negative 3 times 1 is negative 3 plus y equals 8. Negative 3 plus what number gives us 8? Negative 3 plus what number gives us 8? Negative 3 plus 11 gives us 8. And then our last one, negative 3 times 2, which is negative 6 plus y equals 8. Negative 6 plus what number gives you 8? Negative 6 plus 14. Okay, so we have our table complete now. This graph is a line. One hint that you will have graphs that are lines versus discrete or continuous versus discrete. When you have a y equals mm, like 3x plus 8 or if you have an equation, chances are you're going to, or if you have an equation, you're going to have a continuous function. If you just have a list of a bunch of points, it is discrete, okay? Now, this graph is a line, so let's connect these point or let's graph these points. We have a negative 1, 5. So negative 1 in the x direction means I'm going to go left and then 5, it's positive 5, so I'm going to go up in the y direction. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Except I did not count correctly. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. There we go. And then we have 0, 8. 0 in the x direction, I stay at the origin, I move up 8. And then 1, 11, I'm going to go right 1 because it's a positive number now for x. And 11 is going to be somewhere up here off my graph. And then 2, 14 is also going to be somewhere up there. So then I need to connect my points because this is a continuous function. It's a line. And I am done graphing now. Let's look at what the next set of directions ask for. This asks us to use the VLT, remember, vertical line test, to determine whether or not it represents a function. The vertical line test, remember, means you can draw a vertical line anywhere on this graph and it should only hit once if it's a function. So if I draw a vertical line like that, it looks like I only hit it in one spot. If I draw a vertical line here, Again, it's only hitting it in one spot. It looks like if I do this anywhere, I should be okay. I'd say this is a function. So you'd say, yes, it passes. 
the vertical line test. Okay? Just to help you guys understand um, what a graph kind of looks like when it doesn't pass a vertical line test, sometimes you see graphs that look like this in the green. And if I were to draw a vertical line, you can see that it hits here and here, which means that this is not a function. So this would be not a function. Okay? But I'm going to erase that just in case you guys get confused. <clears throat> All right. Try this one on your own. Determine whether it is a function. Hopefully you answered with yes. And maybe you just looked at it and you said, okay, if I do a vertical line test, that's an easy way to tell. And no matter where I draw a vertical line, it's only going to hit once, so it's a function. Example four. Now let's look at our function notation. So we have four, f of x equals negative four x plus seven. Find each value. So first we want to look at letter A. We have f of two. What this means is... The 2 replaced our x, so that means the 2 will replace our x. So we have negative 4, and then plug in our 2, plus 7. What's negative 4 times 2? Negative 8 plus 7 equals negative 1. Okay, that's all that's asking for. Let's look at our next one, though. This one's a little trickier. We have... <clears throat> f of negative 3, and then we have a plus 1. What this plus 1 means is you do the same thing that we did up here, but then at the very end you add 1, okay? So let's plug a negative 3 in for x. So we have negative 4 times negative 3 plus 7, right? That's our whole function here. And then, don't forget this part, goes on the end, we have a plus 1. So negative 4 times negative 3 gives us a positive 12, plus 7, plus 1. 12 plus 7 is 19. 19 plus 1 is going to give us 20 as our final answer. Okay? So just be careful when you have something outside the parentheses, you do that at the very end, okay? Try this one on your own, see how you do. Hopefully you ended up with negative 11. If not, be sure to ask either myself or a friend for some help. And let's look at our last example together. We have for h of x, this is also a function notation, but instead of an f, we're using h. You'll see the h used a lot in real world examples, usually dealing with gravity. And so this means as you move on in your science career, this is something that you're going to see pretty frequently, okay? So for h of x, if for h of x equals negative 16t squared plus 68t plus 2, find each value. The same rules apply even though it's an h instead of a, an f. We take that 4, we plug it in, except, oh, sorry, there was a typo on this one and I forgot to fix it. Pretend this is h of t. Um, when you're doing these science problems, t is going to represent time. Okay. Uh, so anyways, same concept as f of x, but with h and t as the variables instead. Okay. So we're going to plug this 4 in wherever we see a t. In this case, we're plugging it in in a couple of places. So let's rewrite this. We have negative 16 times 4 squared plus 68t plus 2. So instead of t, I meant to write 4. 68 times 4 plus 2. Okay, so 4 squared, that's going to give us negative 16 times 16. Then we have 68 times 4, which is 68 times 4 gives us 272 plus 2. And then negative 16 times 16, negative times positive gives us negative. 16 times 16 is 256, plus, and then 272 plus 2. If we combine those, we have 274. 
So we have 274 plus a negative 256. That is going to give us 18 as our final answer. 18 as our final answer there. Okay, so hopefully even though I messed up a couple times with the uh, typo and then forgetting to do something quick, uh, this is what your work should look like. If you have questions on how to do that, be sure that you ask. But let's try one more together. I'm just going to move that out of the way so we can look at this next one. So just like before on the last example, we had that plus one outside of our parentheses. Here we have a two, and then in our parentheses we have h of g. Okay. So what this means, this h of g stays the same, but instead of a number here, we are replacing... We are replacing our variable, t, we are going to put a g wherever there's a t. And then since the 2 is outside of our h of g, at the very end we multiply everything by 2. We're going to distribute that 2. So let's start by writing that. We have 2, and then let's do everything from up top. We have negative 16, and then there's t squared, so we're going to replace that with g squared plus 68g plus 2. Okay, and instead of using parentheses like this, I'm just using brackets. It means the same thing. Now, our last step is going to be to distribute this 2 to all of the members inside the brackets. So 2 times negative 16 is negative 32 g squared, negative 32 g squared, plus what's 68 times 2? We have 136 g plus 4. And that is as simplified as it can be because we don't have any like terms, so that is going to be our answer, okay? I know it might seem a little confusing, but just remember if there's anything outside the um, function notation, you do that at the end, okay? This is the last example for you to try on your own. Good luck. Hopefully you came up with 180 minus 144z squared feet. If not, be sure to ask either a friend or myself. And if you have any questions about anything I covered today, be sure to let me know. I'd be more than happy to help. I hope you guys have a great night.